Now our reading from Malachi 4 uh, will be taken by David. May I encourage you to open a Bible in front of you and follow along with this evening's scripture reading from Malachi chapter 4. It can be found on page 962 of the Bibles in the pews. Malachi chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Let us listen to God's word. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses and the decrees and laws I give him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Amen. Our prayers for others will be led by Heather. Our prayers for others this evening will focus um, on our church here in Northern Ireland uh, and then in three different contexts, so let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the freedom we have in Northern Ireland to meet together and to worship you. Lord, we thank you that your word is taught to us here in Bloomfield and we can so easily access scripture through teaching here in our church, through online resources, books and other Christian resources. Father, we pray that as we meet together this evening, you would focus our hearts and minds on what you would have us be and who you would have us be and who you, what you would have us do in this place. Lord, that we would leave better equipped to be your hands and feet as you change us and challenge us through your word. Lord, we pray that you would use us here in Bloomfield to share you with others and through using us, our friends, families, colleagues, neighbours will be introduced to you. Lord, when we think of the freedom we have here in Northern Ireland, we are starkly reminded of those who do not have such freedom. For those that meet in secret for fear of the financial, social and physical consequences of being known as your follower, and those who are subject to persecution, violence and imprisonment for being your children. Lord, we pray for organisations like Open Doors and Release, Release International as they seek to highlight the injustice and persecution of your people, challenge governments and international bodies and agencies to act and to support. And Lord, we pray for them as they encourage your church to remain faithful to the calling you have given them amongst unimaginable heartache and suffering. For the church in countries like Iraq, Iran, Syria, North Korea, parts of India, Somalia, Eritrea and Pakistan, Lord, we pray. We pray that they would know your love, that they would know your strength, and that they would know you with them. Lord, we pray for your church in Japan, in yet another very different context to our own. Lord, while they have freedom to speak of you and freedom to attend church, the church is so small, and traditionally the Japanese people have seemed in many ways so close to your gospel. Lord, we know that only you can change hearts and it is only by your spirit that anyone would be called to you and come to a saving faith in you. Lord Jesus, we pray for a change of hearts in Japan. Lord Jesus, we pray for a time of change when millions in this country will turn to you. We think of the work of OMF and in particular Helen Little in Japan and we lift Helen and her, and her colleagues before you, especially at this time of grief and sorrow as they mourn the death of their director, David Ferguson. For David's wife and sons and family, we pray your hand of comfort and strength. And for those working in the Japan field who knew David um, and knew and loved him, Lord, we pray your guidance as they continue to serve you amongst a real time of sorrow. 
Lord, may the witness of David's life and the response of the OMF mission family show those who knew David in any capacity the hope we have that you defeated death and in you we have hope of eternity. Lord, we pray at this time of sadness and confusion that that this would be used for your glory and to build your kingdom. Finally, Father, we pray for the church in France. As the country faces elections next week, we pray for a country experiencing huge changes socially, economically, and in terms of faith. Lord, France now proudly hails itself as a country that's secular, and yet, Lord, a small church still remains. We pray for this church, and we pray that they would boldly declare your name and your truth, and as a new generation comes through, totally unaware of you, Lord, there will be massive opportunities for a generation to see you with fresh eyes and see who you are. We pray for evangelical organisations, especially organisations working in universities and in large Muslim groups who are hearing about you often for the very first time. We pray, Lord, that you would use these organisations and your church, as small as it is, um, that people will be able to see you for the first time. And while it looks from from our perspective and from the outside that things are spiralling further away from you, we know that everything is in your hands. And we pray for your almighty hand of change that in what seems like a very dark place to us, your light would shine. Lord, as we lift all these prayers to you, we are so thankful for the freedom you have given us and that in all these things we can pray in your mighty name. Lord, we thank you that while um, our church um, family seems so far away and are in contact so different from us, they are your children and that you will work mightily through them, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would help each of us see how you want to use us who you would have us be and who you would have us share with and how we can show your love to others in our own little part of the world. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you to all who took part tonight in in reading and leading us in our praise as well and and for Bill as well. Thank you uh, for leading our service. Can I encourage you um, to turn back to Malachi chapter 4 And you'll find it on page 962 of the Pew Bibles. So page 962 uh, of the Pew Bibles. It's lovely to see so many out tonight. Um, And can I encourage you or whet your appetite for the next few Sunday nights? Next Sunday night we meet together around the Lord's table. Uh, We'll praise his name, worship him together. But we'll also begin a new sermon series looking at the five solas or alones of the Reformation and how they have still impacted uh, our lives today and even as a church how they still impact us. So why is it that it is faith alone in Christ alone that helps us know him? What difference is it that it's for the glory of God alone? What difference does it make that it's by grace and not by works uh, that we're saved? And so over these next couple of five, or the, next Sunday we look at Scripture alone, then there's a youth service, and then we're looking at each of these solas uh, throughout Scripture. So please, let me encourage you to come along on Sunday nights over these next while in May and June uh, over this time. But let me pray for us as we come to Malachi chapter 4 tonight and finishing out in this prophet's words. Father, this book hasn't been easy to understand. It hasn't been easy to get our heads around what it applies for us today. But Lord, you've been challenging us. You've been teaching us much about your own character, about the way to live before you. And tonight, as we finish out in this book on Malachi, Father, our prayer is that your spirit would help us as we meditate upon it. That, Lord, you will teach us much about yourself again and about what it is to walk that righteous life that you have made for us to walk in. Father, help us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you this tonight. What are you waiting for? What are you longing for? Perhaps just with Easter gone, you're looking forward to the summer months to roll around. You may have indeed books somewhere already. You can see it, can you, in the brochure? already and you're longing for it you're looking forward to it you're slowly paying it off and then it'll come sun sand and away you go and you're looking forward to it maybe you're longing for the exams to finish at school or university it's been a hard slog all year you're into the final home straight as it were and coming to the mid or end of june you'll just be dying for it all to be finished you're longing for it to be over the end of deadlines and revision 
or maybe you're just longing for some good news, that news that will have a significant impact on your life, your situation, your circumstances, and you're waiting for it, you're longing for it. And as we return to Malachi this evening, I'd like you to be able to flick between chapters 3 and 4, because as we have seen previously in chapter 3, verse 1, the people of God were waiting and longing in their lives too. They were longing and waiting for the day of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1 says this. It uses the words, they were seeking it. They were desiring it. Waiting and longing for this day of the Lord. Thinking that this would be a day of triumph for them. A day of glory, a day of joy for all. Despite the reality, as we've been seeing over these last number of weeks. Despite the reality that God's people weren't following in his word. Despite the fact that they weren't responding to him despite their thinking being so skewed that they often thought God thought he enjoyed prospering the evil. And the Lord gives them a reality check in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. Amos said the very same things to his own people in his day. He said this, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. And you see, the whole point is that the Lord was telling his people, you seek my coming, you seek the day of the Lord, you desire it, it will be a day of refining and purifying for you. Are you aware of that, people of God? They were longing for it, desiring it. And the Lord in chapter 3, as we learned a couple of weeks ago, was telling them this will be a refining time. It'll be a purifying time, a day in which the Lord will use the refiner's fire to dross off all the impurities. It'll be a a painful process, but it will ultimately be for the good of the people and for the good of his people. So that's one aspect of the day of the Lord. It will be a refining, a purifying. And we said that that happened when the Lord came and how he did it was through the cross of Calvary. But there's another aspect to the day of the Lord that we find here in chapter 4, verse 1, in our passage tonight. Do you see it? And it is vital, and I'm repeating myself from a previous sermon that I did. It is vital to remember when that you're reading prophecy or dealing with it, it is vital to remember that here, particularly in chapters 3 and 4, is that it is pictured as one future picture, but separate events. So chapter 3 has told us there'll be a refining. But then how can you go to chapter 4 and it'll say it'll be a final judgment? When do the two come together? And Malachi in his prophecy is dealing with one future picture in different events. And that's what it has here in prophecy. And that's what's going on here in chapters 3 and 4. It is an appearance of one eschological picture, but they are separate future events. And we saw in chapter 3, the Lord's coming will be a refining and purifying. But here in chapter 4, verse 1, the final judgment is what it is speaking about. But in order to understand chapter 4 and the context, you need to understand what has gone on beforehand. And for a moment tonight, have a look at chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Here are the people of God. Try and get your head around what they're thinking and how they're thinking. They're thinking like this. It is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Here are the people of God thinking like this. This was the mindset, the culture. They looked at evildoers prospering, unchallenged, and they were thinking, what good is it to live this Christian life, to serve God? What benefit is there? Do you ever have those thoughts? Teenagers, university students, do you look around at your friends sometimes and think, you know, what's the point? They seem to be enjoying themselves. They're not answerable to mum and dad. They're not restricted with money. They're prospering. They can do whatever they like. What about adults who workplace? Do you ever look at your colleagues and think, like his beamer, why can't I go out and do that? Look at his wife, she's like a doll. And it's that prospering. 
It's that sense of maybe there's wrongdoing going on in work and they're prospering, they go unescaped, and you think, what's the point? What's the point of serving God? What's the point of having integrity and honesty? What's the point in caring or doing the right thing? And this is the way the people of God were responding. They were responding with this mindset that they looked at the even and saw them prosper. They said, God lets them escape. And God responds to their flawed and unbiblical thinking by saying to them in chapter 3, verse 18, you will see again the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. You will see it. You will see this distinction between the wicked and the righteous. And then the Lord speaks in chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, surely the day is coming, or behold, the day is coming. That day being the day of judgment. I wonder, have you ever given much thought about this day when the Lord will come to exercise his judgment to judge? Ever since the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, we've been in end times. And behold, the day is coming when Jesus will come as the Son of Man, as Bill was explaining, who judges the world and its people. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 tells us it will be a day when Jesus will be swift to witness against the sinner. Acts 17 tells us, for he, that is God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, that is Jesus, he has appointed. He has given proof by raising him from the dead. There is a day coming when God will judge, when his justice will be exercised. But look at the picture, the imagery that is used to describe this day, this day of judgment that is to come in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, the day is coming. It will be like a furnace, a burning oven. In the summer, we, we will be six years living in Northern Ireland, believe it or not. It's hard to believe. And over that time, I've probably done, Bill has probably done many more, I've probably done 35 funerals or been involved in 35 funerals. And one of my first ones ever was up in Roselawn Crematorium. And to this day, I still think the undertakers were having a laugh with me because they invited me downstairs in the crematorium. I just buried a woman. The coffin went, as you know, downstairs into the to area. And there are two furnaces, as best my memory serves me, downstairs. And these boys tried to tell me about temperature. They tried to tell me how quick a body burns. They tried to show me a box of screws in the corner. I think it was to frighten me. And all that struck me at that moment when you see these furnaces is nothing survives it. Everything is burnt up. Everything is swallowed. Now, whether you like crematorium or burial into the ground, I know what I like. But it's there, and it's the reality of that day. And the furnace hit me. And here we have this imagery of a furnace, a burning oven as the day of the Lord. It's burning up. It says all the arrogant, do you see it? And evildoers will be stubble. And that day is coming, we'll set them on fire. It's a bit like what happens, isn't it, when the harvest is brought in. Do you ever see, remember the fields when they used to burn them years ago? And the, and the fields are burnt. It's like that. They'll be burnt up. It'll be stubble, burnt stubble. And at the end of verse 1, it says this, not a root or a branch will be left to them. It is a frightening picture of the judgment day of the Lord against sinners. But contrast this picture with the thinking that we just looked at of God's people regarding the arrogant and the evildoers. In chapter, 15, in chapter 3, verse 15, they were saying things, the arrogant, the evildoer are blessed. They're prosper. They escape. What does God say in chapter 4, verse 1? No, says the Lord. Those who are sinners, those who are arrogant, the wicked, will face the judgment of God and there will be no escape, no prospering, and certainly... They are not blessed. The question I have with this is, how are we not all in this category? How are we not all doomed? We're arrogant. We're evildoers. We're sinners. What is it that saves us or rescues you or me or spares us from the day of the Lord's judgment? Malachi spoke about election. I love you because I love you. He chose those before the creation of the world to be blameless in his sight. Partly one time you responded to Christ. He made you righteous in Christ, legally right before him in his sight. You responded, but the Lord enabled you really. 
and he put you right. In New Testament language, we talk about having no fear, don't we? And that's what was happening here with Malachi's day. They had no fear of God, the means by which they regarded God or his way or his word. And tomorrow you'll rub shoulders with people who've no fear of God, no regard for his word, no claim on his life, and they don't really care. But one day God's judgment is coming. It will pass. And the Lord here is clear to point out the distinctions between the wicked and the righteous. And he goes on in verse 2, having painted a very frightening, dark picture in verse 1 of his judgment. He then turns around in verses 2 and 3, and he says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Do you see the massive contrast here? For those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways, they can expect the following. The son of righteousness will rise. One commentator puts it like this. On the day of the Lord, the righteousness will become apparent, just like the shining sun in all its brightness and blessedness. There's a couple of ways to look at righteousness. I've just described one with that legal understanding of being put right with God. But there is also that understanding in the Bible of living righteously, by walking in the ways of God, by doing what is good and right and upright according to the word. And imagine for a moment that as we do that, as we stand righteous before God, as we live the life that he has called us to live, we're living in a bit of a dark room. But on the day that the Lord comes, he says it will be like the midday sun coming out. All that is righteous and good and perfect will shine as the sun shines on the day of the Lord's return. What an image it is. Because uh, if you struggle to live this righteous life, if you look around and you say to people, what is it worth it? One day, the righteousness will shine. It will be bright. It will be like the sun on the day. But there's more. What further difference will this make to those who fear the Lord? Verse 2, they will know healing. What an encouragement to hear this tonight. For those of you here tonight who have suffered for being a follower of Jesus, maybe it's isolation at work, ridicule, mocking. For those who suffered in body, mind, and soul for living for God, for those persecuted physically, like our brothers and sisters in North Korea or other parts of the world, all who are his who have faced persecution, suffering, torture, isolation for the sake of Jesus' name, will on the day of the Lord no healing. And so it shouldn't surprise us when God tells us that in the new heaven and the new earth, in the city, did you take up the little point? There are trees in the middle of the city for healing of the nations. And it's the same idea here in Malachi, that there will be suffering, there will be persecution to endure, but healing will come in the day of the Lord's coming when righteousness shines like the sun in the aftermath of God's judgment. What a wonderful promise to hold on to. This morning, as the kids sat up the front, I think this is going to be a key verse for that generation. They will suffer for the Lord. They will suffer more than our generation will for claiming him as their Savior and Lord. They need to hear that one day there will be healing when he comes to judge and put things right. But look at this, there's more in store for the righteous in that distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous. Do you see at the end of verse 2, there is life and joy. Do you see it, how it's put? At this time of year, many farmers, and, and even a couple of months, weeks ago, have been taking livestock that have been in sheds all, all winter, and they have opened the gate and let them out. I had the experience of this. My dad used to have a milk machine business where in the 80s and 90s, and I remember having this experience of seeing this, where this farmer opened up this shed door in March, and what popped out were these young calves, and they were just mad. They were just full of life, eager to get out on the fields, and they were dangerous a little bit as well because of that joy, because of that exuberance of life that was in them. They just sprung out of it. They've been in a shed all the time. And this is the image that is used at the end of verse 2, where young calves are released out from the sheds in spring. They jump. They are literally full of life. And that is the picture here. 
For those who fear the Lord on the day of the Lord's coming and judgment, they will be like calves leaping with life and joy. What a wonderful picture to see the righteousness of God and his people shine so brightly, to know that there will be healing, but then also to know that there will be life and joy. And then in verse 3, we see more distinction between the wicked and the righteous in what I've termed as a reversal of rules. At the end of, look at verse 3, it says this, then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. If you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, or even that worst one called 300, which is so animated and, and pictured on by digital, they're movies about armies, warriors. Then you'll be familiar with this picture in verse 3. It's the picture of the army general who has overcome his enemy. He is victorious. And the way this was shown is, maybe I should do this with Bill, is that you get the, you've defeated him, you're victorious, and then you put your foot on his neck. You're okay, Bill. You're all right. But it's a conquering feel to it, isn't it? It's that conquering. It's a sign that you're gone, that you've overcome, defeated. And this is the picture in verse 3 for the people of God, for those who are the righteous. The Lord Almighty is going to judge his enemies. But the verse says it will be the people of God, you, who trample down the wicked. Their ashes will be under your soles or your feet. It's a role reversal. The wicked before this have been prospering. They've escaped sanction. But now the reverse is ultimately happening. The wrongs are being put to right. The judgment of God is dealing with sin and sinners and evildoers. And for those who inflict suffering on the people of God, one day the wicked will be underfoot. It's a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? As an imagery, when you think about it. Because even as I said about Bill, deliberately, you felt sorry for Bill, didn't you? You're going, what's wrong with him <laughs> in saying that? And sometimes that's the way we think about the justice of God too. It seems a bit cruel, a bit unfair. But folks, we have never dealt with God's justice because we're not used to a justice that is perfect and pure and is exercised in such way. For the future generation, here's a promise again that they will share in the victor that is Christ, united to him. As he reigns, his people will reign with him. And the imagery here is one where they are victorious over the enemies of God. And then to finish tonight, God's word says to the people of God in verse 4, it looks back and Malachi says to them, remember the law of life in verse 4. He makes them look back to Moses and the giving of the law where the law reflected the nature and character of God. It showed the people the way to live and it was a law that brought life and blessing. And the word remember here means to keep in mind and to put into practice. And that is what we so often forget. Malachi's people did. We do it the same when it comes to dealing with conflict or sin or leadership or worship or giving. All the things that Malachi has been addressing in his book, they'd forgotten. They didn't remember because if they did, they would have lived it out, put it into practice. And Malachi finishes tonight reminding the people of his day, remember the word of God. Fear and revere the Lord. Walk in his righteous ways and then can only be done by keeping and minding and practicing God's word in all aspects of life. So Malachi looks back to Moses, but then he looks forward to the coming of Elijah in verses 5 and 6. And we know from previous week, if you were here, that this Elijah figure is John the Baptist, who had an Elijah-type ministry, calling people to repentance, turning them back to God, fathers to children, children to their fathers. And the book ends then with this, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. It's not a nice way to finish off a book, is it? Lots of love. No, Malachi goes, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. He tells them, look back to the word of God. Look forward to this Elijah figure in the ministry of John the Baptist. But folks, tonight we live in redemptive history where Elijah has come in the person of John the Baptist. We're looking back. 
The Lord has come to purify his people and he did it by becoming a curse at the cross of Calvary. And now we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord's day of judgment. Do you long for that day? Are you waiting for it? There's a bit of caution about that, isn't there? Because on one hand, you think of family members and friends and family and even yourself and you think, am I right with the Lord? What about them? And that should drive our evangelism and our profession of Jesus. Is it pointless to serve the Lord? Does he care about justice? Is there any difference between the righteous and the wicked? Do the wicked prosper, test God, and escape? We see the answers to these in these verses before us tonight. Behold, the day is coming when my son will judge. That judgment will be a massive difference for those who fear the Lord and for those who don't. And so Malachi would say to us today, keep following the Lord, for this is the outcome for those who fear the Lord and for those who don't. For those who fear the Lord, they will see God's righteousness permeate all of life, shining like the sun, healing life, joy, and triumph is to come. And the, for the enemies of God, there is a fearful expectation of what he will do. Let me close in prayer this evening. Father, we confess tonight that we often don't long for this day to come. We're not waiting for it. And partly, Father, if we're honest with you, it's because we don't fully understand it. And yet tonight, Lord, we thank you for your word to us that reminds us that those who have been made right with God can look forward to that righteousness shining like the midday sun. Father, we can look forward to the fact that there will be healing when you come Father, we look forward to the fact that there will be life and joy and that your enemies will one day be defeated. Father, may those things drive us to have an unbridled desire to follow after you in these days, to walk with you in righteousness, to follow your word, to love your son for all that he has done. But Lord, may this day also make us passionate about making him known to those who are in danger of falling into the hands of the God who will judge. Father, we thank you tonight for your electing love. May it not make us arrogant or boastful, but in fact humble and lovers of yourself and lovers of others that they too may come to know Christ, we pray. Lord, help us to understand your word tonight, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen.